So let's do a simple example. Okay, we've got a two degree of freedom system here. It's relatively complicated. We have dampers. We've got springs connecting the mass to ground and to another mass. And that here we notice that M2 also has a spring connecting it to ground. Okay, so there's, um, it's a little bit more complicated than the systems we've seen before. Um, but using the quick method from chapter 5, we can determine relatively straightforwardly the equation of motion. But we're not going to use that quick method. I'm going to use Lagrange's equation to get the same result. Just to show you how it works. Like I said, with linear systems, it's probably quicker to use the stuff we did in Chapter 5. But for nonlinear systems, you can't. You have to use the uh, Lagrange's method. But this is just to demonstrate the process. And so, kinetic energy, well, we've got two masses. Okay, so we have one half mv squared for both masses. Okay, so if I take the first mass, okay, m1, that moves in the motion x1. So one half m1 x1 dot squared. Okay, it's going to be my kinetic energy for mass one, and the same for mass two. Okay, so there's, that's relatively straightforward, nice and easy. For the kinetic uh, potential energy, neglecting gravity. So there's no MGHs, this is all just the spring forces. So we've got 1 half K1 X1, dot, uh, X1 squared, okay, which is the motion of X1, and so there's just that one spring. We've got 1 half K2, and that's between, that's the relative motion between X1 and X2. Okay. Now notice, because this is squared, it doesn't matter the order you put these in, because it will get us exactly the same result, so don't stress about that too much. Okay. But it's the relative motion, it's not the um, individual motion. So we've got the relative motion, x1 minus x2 squared, okay, times by k2. And then obviously, as I said, there was a spring connecting mass 2 to ground. And so that's 1 half k2 x2 squared. And then the, the next line down, I've just multiplied out that uh, middle term, this one here. Okay, I've multiplied it out. Like I said, if that's the other way around, if you put x2 minus x1, you'll get exactly the same result down here. It doesn't really matter. And then I, what I've done is I've grouped them together in terms of, uh, well, I've just, you know, again, multiplied things out, and you can group them together how you see fit. <coughs> <coughs> so I can work out what R is, okay? So that's, I've got my two dampers in there. Damper 1 is related just to the motion of X1, okay? So I've got 1 half C1, X1 dot squared. And then the second damper was between the two masses. And so, again, I've got the relative, uh, relative velocity of the two masses in there, um, multiplied by one half c two, and again, I multiply this out. Again, it doesn't matter the order because you get the same result. And then I've just written it out in long form there. So I can work out what L is if I go back to my kinetic energy and uh, potential energy. There's my kinetic energy, those two terms, and there's my potential energy, all those terms. Obviously, it's a minus sign in here, so obviously all those minuses have changed to pluses, and all the pluses have changed to minuses. So, this is where we start the process of differentiation. Well, I'll set up the generalized coordinates first. x1 is q1, q2 is x2, and then obviously the big ones will be any forces that are being applied. I've not defined the forces in this problem, I've simply um, called them f1 and f2. So, let me, let's go back to uh, there's L, okay. The first process is to find dl over dx dot. Okay, well, it's quite straightforward because all the terms, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, do not contain x dot. Okay, so they're all assumed to be constant. You take the derivative of a constant, you get zero. They all disappear. We're dealing with q1, okay, or x1. So obviously this one is also a constant. So we get that disappears. So the only term that we have to deal with when we're differentiated with respect to x1 dot, is this first term. If you take the derivative of this, obviously, the 2 comes down in front, 2 times a half becomes 1, you end up with m1 x1 dot, which is what we get. Okay? Anything that doesn't have x1 dot in it is a constant, it disappears. So you just have to deal with the term that's got x1 dot in it. Okay? And you take the straightforward derivative. There's no, you know, you don't have to use the product rule or anything like that. It's just the straightforward derivative of x1, oh, sorry, x1 dot. 
Now then, you, when you take the time derivative, well, there's something in here that's going to vary with respect to time, and that is x. Okay, we've got x, well, and that is x dot even. And obviously, if you take the time derivative of x dot, you get x double dot. So there's our first term. Okay, d by dt of dl over dx1 dot gives me mx1 double dot. Okay. Okay, now we look at x1 on its own. Well, if I go back to my l, there's my l. I'm looking for x1 now. This is a constant, drops to zero. This is a constant, drops to zero. I've got to deal with this term. There's an x1 here. I've got to deal with this term. There's an x1 here. And I've got to deal with this one. There's an x1 here. That's x2. That's x2. They're both constants. They disappear. So I've got three terms to look forward to. Okay. Take the derivative of this. Obviously, the 2 comes down. This becomes k1x1. This one, the 2 comes down. This becomes k2x1. And this one, obviously, I've got some constant multiplied by x1. If I take the derivative with respect to x1, the x1 disappears. I just end up with the constant. And so I end up with this. Okay. So this, if you remember, was minus 1 half k1x1 squared. You take the derivative with respect to x, you get the 2 coming down. 2 times a half is 1. Okay, so you end up with 1 times k1x1. Again, this was, that was the same process here. And here we had k2x1, x2. You take the derivative of that with respect to x1. The x1 disappears. You just end up with the, with the constant k2x2. Then lastly, for x1 dot with r, okay, so this, you don't deal with l this time. You just look at your r. And again, the same process applies. The twos come down, and you end up getting rid of the halves and uh, getting rid of those x squared, x dot squares and stuff. You end up with this equation. So then you apply Lagrange's equation. Now there's Lagrange's equation. Like I said, our force is at q1, and we end up with this. Okay. So here's our. Um, this is that term. If you remember, that turned into mx double dot. This is our l uh, d, d l over dx term, which is in here, but that's a minus sign. So these are going to turn into a plus. And then over over here, we've got our damping term. And like I said, if you ma 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 um, rearrange it, um, sorting out the terms multiplied by x1 double dot, x1 dot, x2 dot, x1 and x2, then you get this equation. You can repeat the process for i equals 2. Okay, So there we go. Again, with L, you take it with respect to x2. Okay. You then take the time derivative, so the x2 in here turns into x2 double dot. You take the uh, derivative of L with respect to x2. Okay, and then Again, you go through the process, you get this. And then if you take the derivative with respect to x2 dot, sorry, the derivative of r with respect to x2 dot, you end up getting those two terms. And again, you can group them together, right? put them into Lagrange's equation, and you get that uh, second line or third line down there. Now, if I put those two together, there's, there's the two equations. What we can do is we can write those equations in matrix form. Okay. Because we've got x1s and x2s, they're coupled motion the equations of motion. But because of the, the fact they're linear, we can actually write them in terms of matrix form, and you end up getting this, which is what you get from the quick method. We've got the masses down the diagonal, okay, everything else is zero times by x1 dot, x2 double dot. There's those two terms there. Okay. With the damping, the diagonal, we've got the dampers between, um, you know, we take mass 1, okay, we take the dampers between ground and another mass. Well, there was one damper between ground, and there was one between the masses, so C1 plus C2. Mass 2 only had the damper connecting it to mass 1, so that's my C2 in here. And then obviously between the masses, we've got minus C1, uh, sorry, minus C2. Okay, and that's multiplied by the uh, uh, velocity. And then the same thing with the springs. We had, um, for mass 1, we had the spring K1 connecting it to ground, and spring K2 connecting it to the other mass. For mass 2, we had spring K2 connecting it to mass 1, and K3 connecting that mass to ground. Okay, so there's the diagonals. And between the springs, we had, my, oh, we had K2, so we've got minus K2 on the off diagonals, multiplied by your displacement equals your forcing function. So there, like I said, we've gone through the same process. Sorry, we've gone through Lagrange's equation. 
to find these equations here, and we end up with the same thing that we get from the Newton's second law, the quick method. Okay, so the same process, sorry, the same result from a different process. 